Welcome to the Klipsch Museum of Audio History. My name is Jim Hunter, and this has been a pet project of mine for the past 30 years. Our former president, Bob Moores, was fond of saying, asking Paul Klipsch a question about audio is like getting a drink out of a fire hydrant. Fortunately for me, I've been drenched a few times. Our museum is housed in the building behind me. Now, this was the Southwest Proving Ground Telephone Exchange Building during World War II. While the building cost $49,000 to build it, Paul stuck around after the war and was able to pick it up for just $3,000. It became our first factory and Paul moved into it May 3rd, 1948. While the majority of the items in the museum are Klipsch derived, uh, a great many are not. Uh, Paul was very fond of Isaac Newton's quote, if I have seen further than others, it's because I've been standing on the shoulders of giants. Uh, Paul used this a lot, and our collection includes a lot of material from the giants, uh, also some from some competitors, and a few charlatan artifacts. Edison did not record sound uh, for the very first time in history. However, his talking machine is credited with starting our industry. Uh, I do feel compelled to begin our tour with an Edison laboratory model. This is a W250 circa 1917. Uh, and we'll give this thing a listen. There's a man named Crossite Pat, way out west in Kansas. You can't tell who he's looking at, way out west in Kansas. He cries because he's such a wreck, and the tears run down the back of his neck. He goes to the street to him. Now this machine comes with a mechanical volume control. Uh, it uh, is a felt ball. Uh, Paul Klipsch referred to it as a plumber's help. Uh, this machine has a horn in it large enough to go down to about four or five hundred hertz. That gives the machine a bandwidth of just a little over two octaves. Uh, that's very restricted. However, the ear and the brain can extrapolate a small amount of information uh, and fill in the missing pieces, the low frequency. Uh, basically, it's list you're listening to the harmonics of the low tones, and that allows the brain to perceive the actual low tone. Uh, this is really the only reason that these early uh, phonographs uh, gave you any hint of a bass note. Here we also have a couple of portable phonographs. I refer to them as early Walkmans. Here we have a mid-1920s uh, Victor orthophonic phonograph. In the mid-1920s, Bell Telephone was doing many experiments in acoustics of all different types. Uh, one of the programs they were doing, uh, Maxfield and Harrison, were developing electrical recording. Uh, and as they developed electrical recording, they also designed an acoustic phonograph uh, to play those electrical recordings back. Uh, this orthophonic, uh, I believe, was the first time that engineers actually used analogous circuit techniques uh, to design the system. Now that, uh, by that I mean that they converted all of the mechanical and acoustical properties into electric circuit elements uh, because they were electrical engineers and they uh, could then solve the electrical circuit and then put everything back into the mechanical and acoustic domains. Uh, what we have here, this entire area is the mouth of a folded exponential horn. In their electrical circuit, the horn was a transformer. Uh, the diaphragm is 2 mil aluminum. Uh, it has a tangential compliance, uh, which is uh, very cutting edge today in some compression drivers. Uh, they the springiness of the diaphragm would have been a capacitor. Uh, the mass of the needle would have been an inductor. In any case, all of these elements were put in a circuit and solved. And what resulted was a phonograph that had a bandwidth of over five octaves compared to the earlier phonographs with a little over two. The ortho 
photophonic phonograph was definitely a major breakthrough at that time, but the mid-20s saw another form of audio entertainment come to the forefront, and that was radio. Uh, radio initially was a somewhat private experience. Uh, you'd have a guy with a pair of headphones, such as these, listening to his radio. But as the 20s wore on, there was a lot more program material, and it became a family entertainment uh, situation. So you had to buy a loudspeaker to entertain the whole room. Uh, one of the earliest radio speakers that we have is a 1919 Western Electric CW929. Uh, on the back of it, it is actually labeled loudspeaking telephone. I've often wondered if that is the origin of the word loudspeaker. This black speaker down here is affectionately referred to as a dog pile. Uh, it is a very contorted exponential horn, but it's very similar to one that Paul Klipsch had in South America. Uh, it was this type of horn compared to a direct radiator that led him to realize that horns were much more efficient. Uh, another early speaker from Western Electric was a transverse wave principle dipole speaker. By transverse wave, I mean that if you put a drop of water into a pond, you'll see the waves ripple outward from that drop. The same general principle applies to this uh, speaker. The ancients were doing a lot of things that we think are modern now. In this case, uh, we have first a dynamic speaker. It's a Utah, and it is very similar to the Rice and Kellogg original patent for the moving coil loudspeaker. Uh, one interesting thing is that the surround material is actually leather and is still in good shape. Uh, we have several other radios here, another dipole Western Electric, and on top we have some very early vacuum tubes. These were before they even had sockets. Uh, this vacuum tube here is a Western Electric VT-1. I believe it was used in early World War I aircraft transmitters. And we have a couple of radios. This radio in particular has uh, a variable inductor. Paul was always uh, kind of tickled with it. And we have a very early Western Electric uh, amplifier, and the tubes are actually hand-blown. This chambered radio is really nothing too special, uh, but it is a little unusual in that someone has disconnected the top of the radio, hinged it, and put a phonograph inside of it. Uh, this is definitely after the fact and could have been Paul Klitsch. More research is needed. In the early 1990s, the Klipsch Marketing Department created three collages uh, to describe some of the history of the company, and they were in two-decade collages. This first collage is from the 1940s and 50s. Uh, one of the items here is the original Klipsch horn. Uh, this is the X3 woofer and the X5 high-frequency horn. Uh, this Klipsch horn it's very likely the most highly stylized Klipsch horn. It was done by one of our dealers in Albuquerque. Uh, these drawings here are the drawings that were sent to Baldwin Piano Company to make the first 12 Klipsch horn cabinets. Up here we have Arthur Fiedler getting an audio lecture from Paul Klipsch. And this is Paul's wife, Belle. Uh, Arthur Fiedler, in 1953, uh, signed a contract with Klipsch to allow his name uh, to be used in Klipsch advertising. And for that, uh, we gave him a Klipsch horn. Uh, that Klipsch horn we'll look at a little bit later in another room in the museum. Uh, this is the infamous picture of Paul in front of Cook's dry cleaning. Uh, that really was his first factory of sorts, and the building we're in is considered his second factory. Uh, this FM TV radio magazine uh, has the Klipsch horn on the cover. This is the May 1950 issue. Uh, yesterday I made another little discovery. 
the radio pictured here under the caps is actually over here. 